So chapter 18, markets for the factors of production. And let's put our objectives up here. And move right on into the anatomy of factor markets. So four factors of production are, remember, labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurship. The market for labor services. What does labor give us? People and firms who trade labor services. Labor services are the physical and mental work that people supply to produce the goods and services. I want to ask you all to help me out here. All right, so the physical and mental work that people supply to produce goods and services. A labor market, when we talk about a labor market, remember a collection of people and firms who trade labor services. And the price of labor services is the wage rate. Most labor markets have many buyers and many sellers and many are competitive. And the, these type of labor markets, the wage rate is determined by supply and demand. Okay, so we'll be replying to a wage rate, uh, just think here in the USA. Markets for capital services. Capital, the tools, instruments, machines, buildings, and other constructions that have been produced in the past and that businesses now use to produce goods and services. These physical objects are capital goods and they trade in goods markets. And there is not a market for capital services. A market for capital services can be called a rental rate, a market in which the services of capital are hired. Land services, natural resources. The price of these services of land is a rental rate. And non-renewable natural resources. These are resources that can be only used once and will include items such as oil, natural gas, and coal. The prices of non-renewable natural prices are determined in the global commodity market. So there, they trade on open exchanges. Entrepreneurship. Services are not traded in markets. Entrepreneurs receive the profit or bear the loss resulting from their business decisions. The demand for a factor of production is a derived demand. Remember, we're supply, we're saying that in a normal weight environment, Supply and demand forces are in play here. And the demand for a factor of production is derived from the demand for the goods that is used to produce. The quantities of factors of production demanded are a consequence of firms' output decisions. A firm will hire the quantities of factors of production that everybody at one time, maximize its profits. All right, so the value of the firm of hiring one more, here's one of these terms. Remember that kind of sounds familiar from before. The value to the firm of hiring one more unit of a factor of production is called the value of marginal product. And let's look at that. The value to the firm of hiring one more unit of a factor and the value of marginal product is equal to the price of a unit of output multiplied by the marginal product of that factor. Table 18.1 shows the value 
of marginal product. All right, so the value of marginal product of labor, we say equals the price of the product multiplied by the marginal product of labor. So in this example, if Angelo hires two workers, the marginal product of the second worker is six loads. And we see this here in the third column. Now the value of that marginal product is what? Well, if we give it a value of $2 per loaf and we take the $2 per loaf and multiply it by the six loaves, we get the value of the marginal product of the second worker is $12. <clears throat> now, firms demand for labor. The value of the marginal product of labor tells us what an additional worker is worth to the firm. So in this last example, $12. And this is the revenue that the firm earns by hiring one more worker. And we can compare that to the wage rate, which would be the cost of hiring that additional worker. And combined, this is going to help determine the quantity of labor demanded by a firm. And a firm maximizes its profit by hiring the quantity of labor at which value of the marginal is equal to the wage rate. If the cost exceeds, the, the benefit exceeds the wage rate, what? The firm can increase profit by employing one more worker. If it's less than the wage rate, the firm must fire one worker if it wants to increase profits. And wherever we find the value equal to the wage rate, we are maximizing profit here. So in figure 18.1, we're gonna show a relationship between a firm's value of marginal product and its demand for labor. And we're gonna keep looking at Angelo. All right, so let's put some bars up here. And these are gonna show the marginal product. And what do we notice? It goes down. As it goes down as we add additional units of labor. So it's diminishing. And now, let's put a curve here. The value of marginal product curve, we said, is diminishing. So the value marginal product of the third worker is $10 an hour. So what's he going to do at... $10 an hour. For $10 an hour, you're going to make sure that there's three people hired? The wage rate is $10 an hour. You are correct. The firm's going to hire three workers. Changes in a firm's demand for labor. Firm's demand for labor, we just said, is going to depend on the price of the firm's output, the price of other factors of production, and technology. The higher the price of a firm's output, the greater is the firm's demand for labor. And the price of output affects the demand for labor through its influence on the value of marginal product of labor. 
if the price of using capital decreases relative to the wage rate, a firm will substitute capital for labor and increase the quantity of capital it uses. The demand for labor would decrease when the price of using capital falls. And that's a good transition into technology. As new technologies are introduced, they're gonna decrease the demand for labor. They're also gonna increase the demand for other types of labor. And look at this example. An automated bread making machine becomes available. A bakery might install one of these machines and fire most of its workforce. A decrease in the demand for bakery workers. But the firms that manufacture and service automated bread making machines will hire more labor, so there's an increase for the demand type of this labor. Eric, can you speak about anything since you're a technology expert? I'm sure you've got many examples. For man, uh, automated activities that replace workers? Correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, where I work, uh, I'm in charge of uh, EDI processes, which is like electronic ordering for our customers. Um, it's like system to system, like their ERP system to our ERP system. Mm -hmm. That ultimately reduces the amount of inside sales and customer service representatives at our facility administering sales orders. So if the customer is able to purchase it themselves, is that what you're saying? Right. They more or less, all they do is they enter the order into their system. Instead of somebody on our side entering in the order manually, everything's all automated and displaces that. So your firm has probably seen a reduction in one type of labor. Right. But the other side has seen an addition of a type of labor in order to supply that service. Right. You're overseeing it, so there's another addition of a type of labor. True. You know, and that's kind of the inside, I think, thought with technology is, yes, technology can make individuals and make firms and countries even more efficient, but it still requires someone to manufacture and service that technology. And on an internal side, it takes someone to oversee and use that technology. Mm -hmm. Again, I like to think about this class right now, think of economics. All of these graphs can be seen daily in the news, in the newspapers. So creating these graphs, computers, logarithms, technology can produce these results. But the knowledge you're picking up here is how you can interpret that data. How you can make that data relevant to some employer that would spark interest in that individual hiring you, that entrepreneur investing in you. Good example. All right, so a market in which many firms demand labor and many households supply labor, we say this is a competitive market. And each firm's, let's look at a demand for labor curve. Because each firm's demand for labor curve slopes downward, so does the market demand curve. Now, people allocate their time, and you people, think of yourself, allocate your time between leisure and labor, and this choice determines the quantity of labor supplied, and it's gonna be dependent upon the wage rate. As wage rate increases, you're probably gonna be more willing to swap time spent on leisure and add time spent into labor. A person's reservation wage is the lowest wage rate for which he or she is willing to supply labor. As the wage rate rises above this reservation wage, the household changes the quantity of labor supplied. So you all have your lowest price that you'd be willing to work for. And as wages rise higher and higher above that reservation rate, 
more individuals and more households are going to join the labor market. So at $5 an hour, Jill supplies no labor. At $10 an hour, she's willing to supply 30 hours of labor. At $25 an hour, she's willing to do 40. So Jill's supply of labor curve is backward to bending. So the income effect on the demand for leisure is going to dominate the substitution effect here. I just want to ask you what your previous job paid you. No. Is this why they, when you go for a job interview, the firm asks you what did you, what was you, what was your salary? previous salary or your current salary? Um, yeah, that's probably to get confidence in whoever's signing the check. All right, a substitution effect. A wage rate below $25 an hour, the higher the wage rate, the greater the quantity of labor that Jill will supply. This wage rate is Jill's opportunity cost of leisure. Look at it that way. And the substitution effect describes how a person responds to an increasing opportunity cost of leisure. They will reduce the amount of leisure and increase the quantity of labor supplied. Income effect. All of these terms you've seen before. The income effect, the higher the wage rate, the greater is Jill's income. An increase in income is going to enable the consumer to buy more of most goods and leisure is a normal good. The income effect describes how a person responds to a higher wage rate. The person will increase the quantity of leisure and decrease the quantity of labor supplied. So here, let's look at an individual supply labor curve. It's not going to show us. But the labor supply curve would slope upward at low wage rates, but eventually would bend backwards at higher wage rates. Now, the market supply curve shows the quantity of labor supplied by all households in a particular job market. And here is what we see in a competitive labor market. So a competitive labor market, we say, is one in which coordinates a firm's household and firms and household plans. So remember, there's a supply and demand of what firms are willing to hire and what individuals are willing to supply. And we would say that the market is in equilibrium at the intersection of our supply and demand curve. And in this example, equilibrium falls at what quantity? At $10 per hour? Correct. So at $10 an hour, we would expect 300 million workers to be employed. Now, if the wage rate increased above $10 an hour, the quantity demanded would what? Decrease. decrease. Good job. And if the quantity demanded decrease, what do you think would happen to the wage rate? The wage rate would fall? The wage rate would fall also. Good, good job. Now, if the wage rate is below $10 an hour, quantity demanded would exceed the quantity supplied and the wage rate would fall. So we'd have the reverse. 
And again, if we look to our 2008 recession and what the job market looked after that, you know, if any of you were searching for jobs in 2009 and 2010, I'm going to say most of the negotiating powers probably fell on your employers. There were a lot of, during that time, a lot of PhDs working for less educational qualifications. All right, wage rates, we say increase over time. They trend upward because the value of marginal product of the labor trends upward. Techno technological change and new types of capital, the entrepreneurship that makes and brings it to workers are more productive. And with greater labor productivity, the demand for labor increases. Wage rates have become increasingly unequal. Now, just look at the difference between your top executive in an entry level position or even a mid level manager's position. And especially within some of these fortune 500 companies. And we see that the difference between these wage rates has become increasingly, definitely increasingly unequal. So the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. Um, You know, what I did was just point out what was happening. I did not speak to what was the outcome there. Because I wouldn't necessarily say the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. I would say that it helps to have skills that are in demand. And anyway, come back to the macro side next term and we'll continue that discussion. All right, a labor market with a union. Always an interesting subject for an economist to speak on. <clears throat> does anyone belong to a union? My husband does. Your husband does. Okay, I didn't see any hands raise up. But a labor union, and the reason only I ask that question is we see that unions, you know, the influence of unions rise and falls determining on economic conditions and as wage rates are rising and unemployment's decreasing and the economy is growing, I think the influence of unions becomes less relevant. Again, with the right to work laws that many states have enacted, you know, the reach of unions has been shortened. And I just think that the presence of unions in the job market has definitely diminished from what we've seen er compared to earlier in the last century. But a labor union, an organized group of workers that aims to increase wages and influence other job conditions. And one way to raise the wage rate is to decrease the supply of labor. Another way is to encourage people to buy goods produced by union workers, which raises the price of those goods and increases the value of these additional workers. All right, so let's look at an example of a competitive market with a union. All right, unions try to restrict the supply of union labor as a method of increasing the wage rate. Now this action will also decrease the quantity of labor demanded. All right, so here's some of this cause and effects. So the union is gonna decrease the amount of workers it supplies as a method of raising wages. So in a competitive market, the demand curve is the curve here that is D subscript C. And the supply curve in a competitive market is S subscript C. 
See if I can just get those up right here. All right, so in a competitive market, here's what we expect. And here, what's the wage rate? Under competitive market, $10. $10 per hour. And again, in a competitive market at $10 per hour, 300 million workers are willing to work. And those 300 million are employed. Now, if a union decreases the supply of labor, Go back just here. So the union is going to decrease the labor supply. And this is what's going to happen to the supply curve. Now what happened to the wage rate here? The wage rate will rise as the supply uh, shifts to the left. Correct, the wage rate will rise to $15 per hour. And what's the labor demanded at $15 per hour? 200 million workers. So while the wage rate will rise, a possible unintended outcome is the number of workers employed is gonna decrease. Now, if the union increases the demand for labor and shifts the demand labor curve, do you? The wage rate rises to what? $20 per hour. $20 per hour and 250 million workers will be employed. So they gotta be sure that they're watching both supply and demand. All right, here's a new term I'm gonna to introduce to you. Monopsony, a market in which there is only one buyer. And I can say decades ago, examples include large manufacturing plants, steel mills, coal mines, often the sole buyer labor in their local labor markets. You know, in my hometown down in Appalachia, I've heard my family, my grandparents, my dad talk about going to work every morning in a local coal mining community. They would go to work in that mines and they would earn a wage. Now I'm gonna say this, go back to the earlier part of the 20th century up through the 1930s, maybe even into the 40s. So you went to work in the mines and you earned a wage. That wage was paid to you in something called script. And it was a unique monetary unit for that mines. And it can only be spent within that mining community. Each different community produced its own script. You would take that wage, you would take that script and buy your household goods. So you went to work, my grand, but my grandpa would come home with that script, he'd give it to my grandma. And my grandma would go up to the country store. Guess who owned the country store? <laughs> the mines. And she bought everything that her household needed from clothes, groceries to whatever sanitation that was being used then, she bought all of that from the coal mines. First of every month, they paid rent. Couldn't own property there. They paid rent. Who do you think owned their home? The coal mines. So the coal mines took in the rent dollars. And there'd been a good song written about that by Tennessee Ernie Ford talking about the coal mines and how they would earn that script and how they were forever and ever indebted to that coal mining entity. So if they didn't use all the money on their script, it just went back to the coal mine? Well, they could only, I don't think wages were very high then, so I don't think there was a lot left over. I mean, I look back at the homes that my 
parents grew up in and I look at, you know, that community and I don't think there was a lot of wages that I don't think there were excess wages. All right. So now because the monopsony will control the labor market, guess what else they have the power to do? They control the labor market. They have the power to set the wage rate. So in that example, my grandparents did not go up and negotiate the wage rate. The mines told them what they had to do. Now in today, let's jump forward to today and I'll give you some better examples. Throughout many parts of the country, healthcare. All right, large managed healthcare organizations are a major employer of a many healthcare professionals. That's a modern day example. Walmart is a major employer within the sales industry. All right. We could argue that they even have a monopsy in the sales industry. Let's get a graph up here. All right, so like all firms, the monopsony has a downward sloping demand for labor curve. And the supply curve of labor tells us the lowest wage rate for which a quant given quantity of labor is willing to go to work. And because the monopsony controls the wage rate, the marginal cost of labor will exceed the wage rate. So here, the marginal cost of labor curve is going to be upward sloping. And they are going to maximize profit, remembering where the quantity of labor, so the marginal cost of labor, equal to the value of that marginal product. They're going to pay the lowest wage rate for what the quantity of labor will work. And compared to a competitive market, they will employ fewer workers and pay a lower rate. And in this example, making the marginal cost of labor equal to the value of the marginal product, we're going to say they maximize profits. So they're going to hire 100 workers. And at 100 workers, the lower, the lowest wage rate that individuals are willing to work for are $10 an hour. So that's the wage rate they're going to pay. Now, sometimes we have what's called a bilateral monopoly. And this is when a monopsony encounters a labor union. And both the employer and the union must judge each other's market power and come to an agreement. And depending on the relative cost that each party can inflict on the other, the outcome of this bargaining might favor either side. <coughs> so your husband works when he participates in a union. Think of union negotiations here. And the imposition here of a minimum wage might actually increase the quantity of labor hired by monopsony. How come? Well, people are willing to work for more money. Well, now suppose, remember, we said that the monopsony would hire, would only pay out $10 an hour, because that was the minimum rate in which 
individuals were willing to work. Now, suppose the minimum wage rate is set at $15 an hour. So here's our floor. Now, the supply of labor is perfectly elastic from zero to 150 workers. So up to 150 workers, the marginal cost of hiring an additional worker equals the minimum wage. They know each additional worker, worker they hire, it's gonna be equal to the minimum wage. If we go to more than 150 workers, So if a monopsony, the labor market, the wage rate is $10 an hour and 100 workers. If a minimum wage law increases the wage to $15 an hour, wages would rise to that level and the quantity of labor employed would increase to 150 workers. So there represents our increase in employment. Now here, the value of marginal product of tower cranes. Okay, so we're looking at cranes, the rental rate here. So the value of marginal product for these cranes, the value of marginal product is going to determine the demand. And we see that by this curve, the downward sloping curve. And with the supply curve, the equilibrium rate is $1,000 a day. And 100 cranes would be rented. All right, let's look at rent versus buying decisions. The decision to obtain capital services in a rental market rather than buying with capital is implicitly to made to minimize cost. So if it's cheaper to rent, we are going to rent. Firms will compare the cost of explicitly renting the capital and the cost of buying it. So here, The value of marginal product of a 10 acre lot. All right, so the value of marginal product is gonna determine the demand for this. And with the supply curve, the block is going to rent for what price? $1,000 per acre per day. Now let's look at non-renewable natural resources. Remember, oil, gas, and coal. We said that demand and supply were determined in commodity markets. Again, these are publicly traded commodity markets. And here you go, the demand for oil. Equal to the value of marginal product of oil and the expected future price of oil. And I think right now a lot of firms, this is very relevant in today's market right now. When you go back a decade ago, 15 years ago, oil passing $110 per barrel. What's the oil prices today? I believe it's over 40. Yeah, we're getting resistance around 50. Firms would like to even keep it to 50. We've kind of got up to that level, but you are correct as output as output has not been able to be reduced or curbed. And as more and more, we're seeing the more and more players in the, in the, even in the United States. I mean, think of how much more we have increased output. 
you know, we're finding resistance at even $50 a barrel. So the greater the quantity of oil used, the smaller is the value of the marginal product of the oil and demand slopes downward. The higher the expected future price of oil, the greater the present demand for oil. If we thought the price of oil was going to double to $100 a barrel by next year, what will we start doing today? Docking up. Investors would start to buy it. And the future price would be speculative because buyers might want to sell it later for a profit. If they decide to hold it, the opportunity cost is the foregone interest rate. Now, three influences on the supply of oil. Known reserves, the scale of current oil production facilities, and the expected future price of oil. Known reserves, oil that has been discovered and can be extracted with today's technology. The greater the size of the known reserves, the greater the supply of oil. And we find ourselves right now with large supplies of oil. So the scale of current oil production facilitates the fundamental influence on supply. The cost of extracting oil means that the supply curve of oil slopes upward. The higher the price of oil, the greater is the quantity supplied. And again, we look at speculative forces because we are speculating about the future. The higher the expected future price of oil, the smaller is the present supply. And look at some actions that a trader might do. You can sell it now or hold and sell it later. The opportunity cost is the foregone interest rate. The price of oil is expected to rise by a bigger percentage than the interest rate. It's profitable to incur the opportunity cost. In that case, the trader would hold the oil rather than selling it immediately. All right, let's get a graph up here. Now, the value of the marginal product of oil, we said, is the fundamental determinant of demand. And this marginal cost of extraction here, so we, what's the cost of extraction? The fundamental determinant of supply. And together, they're going to determine the market fundamentals. If expectations, so what happens if we expect the price of oil to depart from market fundamentals? What's going to happen? So speculation can drive a wedge between equilibrium price and market fundamental price? Speculation can bring a gap, you're right, between the market fundamental price and the equilibrium price. The hot tailing principle. The idea that traders expect the price of a non-renewable natural resources to rise at a rate equal to the interest rate. If the price of oil is expected to rise at a rate that exceeds the interest rate, it is profitable to hold a bigger inventory. And it's interesting, remember, that each of these are dictated and traded. Supply and demand fundamentals take place on, a, on an exchange in an open market. Any questions? All right. 